It's good to see you, Dan. <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you in your in your new location. Do you want yes. to just uh, uh, give the church a quick a quick rundown on what's happened during the last the last twelve months or so? Well, first of all, I'd like to say hello to them. It seems like it's been forever. And yet when I look at Nick's face here, it seems like it's yesterday. But I really missed being with you and look forward to getting back there and uh, hearing some really great things about what is what God's doing. And so, yeah, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to share with you. So, Dan, um, yeah, um, we've been doing this series on uh, entering the promised land. Um, the journey to the promised land through the wilderness and we've had an amazing time and uh, we've got to that um, that interesting story where the um, they they they, uh, they they get to uh, Kadesh Barnea and, uh, mm -hmm. and try to, to get in the land there and uh, I remember when I was uh, reading your book um, uh, that and uh, maybe you just like to remind us about your book it is a really really good book um, and particularly if there are broken areas of our lives, it's, it's just so yeah. helpful. Um, I, I remember this particular chapter really jumped out at me as being very helpful and very relevant. Um, so um, the question I got, Dan, was um, uh, in this story, we've heard it in the story so far um, that God wouldn't allow the children of Israel to enter the promised land on their first attempt. Um, and in the end, only two of the spies eventually got there, Joshua and Caleb, um, and uh, uh, the other 10 uh, weren't allowed. Um, and uh, what do you think the reason was that the other 10 didn't make it? Um, and is there a parallel between them and us? Hmm. A good question. Um, I think you would have to go back to the fact that the other 10 uh, did not follow God's direction. Uh, they went into the land and saw the same things exactly that Caleb and Joshua did. And yet they came back saying, it's, it's the right place. It's great. It's wonderful. The land that flows with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land and we, we can't take them. We can't go in. We can't do it. And they, keep in mind, too, that they were leaders, a leader of each of the tribes. So these are leaders saying to the people, we can't do this. And, and it, of course, it, it, all the discouragement that came out of that, and it really, in a very real way, they caused the people to disobey what God told them to do and to go in and take the land. And so I think, of course, they didn't go in because they directly disobeyed God, but also because they just, you know, I think they undoubtedly were great people, good men, or they wouldn't have been leaders of the tribe. But somehow they just could not believe that God could take them in, even after all that they had seen and all that they had been through. But Caleb and Joshua, um, one verse says that they were men of a different spirit. In fact, when I looked that up, uh, I noticed that it says men of a different attitude in several translations. And I really like that one better. So they had a, a different attitude than the other spies did. Uh, so I think that's the key to it. That men of a different spirit. They had a different attitude towards how they believed God and towards the fact that God could do exactly what he said he could do. And because of that, God allowed them to go into the land when the others weren't allowed to go in. I mean, the, 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 the two uh, one beautiful images in here that really uh, stick in your mind um, to me are, are giants and grasshoppers. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. How does that imagery kind of play out with you? In the book power of a new identity. Uh, there's a chapter that says tales of men and grasshoppers. And basically, it had to do with how they thought about themselves, uh, how they saw themselves. They saw themselves as insignificant grasshoppers, that they could not go, even though God had promised them, even though God, the whole purpose of bringing them out of Egypt 
was to give them the promised land. And then along the way, he proved himself over and over and over again, a miracle after miracle and some really, really big ones. And uh, crossing of the Red Sea was nothing small. And so they experienced all these miracles. And yet, when it came right down to going into the land, they could not do it because of the way they thought about themselves. They had been slaves in Egypt for generations. And there's a certain mentality that's developed when you're in slavery. And they saw themselves, even though they were the people of God, they saw themselves as insignificant grasshoppers. And in fact, uh, one of the things I often think about is the fact that you know every time the whip would have hit their back as slaves, a message came to them that said, you're slaves. You'll always be slaves. And that lie got in them. And so now, even though God has brought them out of Egypt, they've seen all the miracles of God and the most powerful miracles in history, really. And now they're ready to go in and take the land. They somehow, even when the spies come back and say, it's everything God said it was, but we can't do it. And I think the reason they felt that way is because they saw themselves as insignificant grasshoppers. Uh, it was the way they thought about who God had made them to be. It was the lack of faith in what God had done for them and who he created them to be, mm. how they saw themselves. And they could not go and possess the land they, because, of how they, you know, because of how they saw themselves. I think we do a lot of the same kind of thing. I think most of us believe in a very powerful God. But when it comes right down to it, I think most of us question, will God do his works through us? We can see how God can use certain people. But me, you know, I know me. I know my strength. I know my weaknesses. Uh, and and I, I, know, I know myself. And so it's easy to look at you and say, oh, I could see how God could use them. But when I look at myself with my weaknesses and all these things, I say, how could God use me? And I think that's a lot of what they experience. So I think we experience somewhat the same thing. We see ourselves a certain way and we can believe God could use someone else, but not me. And that's what paralyzed them because of how, because of the lie that they believed about themselves. I believed for years that I was really, I mean, I had the deep, deep inferiority complex and uh, I really couldn't hold a conversation. Now, uh, you know me now and you know that I can't quit talking, but I couldn't, I couldn't hold a conversation through most of my school years, even into Bible college because of some events that took place in my third grade that locked my life up. And they were so strong, and there were so many lies that came out of that, that I deeply believed that even though Jesus touched me and did a lot of great things in my life, deep inside, there still were those lies that I had never dealt with. And I see that, I think to some degree, all of us deal with those things. So yes, I've seen it played out in me in a big way. I mean, the interesting thing is that, that uh, at least we got Joshua and Caleb, haven't we? Um, that for those two guys, that they uh, somehow had this different spirit. And um, maybe that has something to do with the antidote. Um, I mean, um, why do you think Joshua and Caleb were different? And, um, and uh, for yourself, maybe, or things you've seen in other people's lives, what would you say uh, were some of the answers for people who uh, uh, feel, in a sense, uh, limited, paralyzed through this mm -hmm. lack of confidence, whatever it is you, you call it? Well, I'm not quite sure that, that you can clearly look at Caleb and Joshua and, and discover what it was that gave them this confidence. Um, I think obviously it was their relationship with God and they had an attitude that was kind of, I can do it with God's help. I can do it. We can possess this land. We can go in and do it. 
And I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, it's not just seeing ourselves and I'm really good, but it's really seeing how good God is and that we're his and confidence in him that he will do what he says he will do. And again, I think most of us struggle with that because we often see things that, you know, it doesn't turn out the way that we hoped it would, or we see things that can kind of challenge our faith. But as you grow in faith and you grow in that relationship, really faith is relationship. And when you grow in that relationship, it brings you to a place where you're able to take the risks. Uh, I think Caleb and Joshua were risk takers. They were willing to kind of step over. I, I'm sure they had doubts. I'm sure there were some uncertainties, but they were able to push beyond the uncertainty, beyond the doubt. And, uh, you know, uh, courage, for instance, isn't the lack of fear. It really is, you know, it's the lack of being, or it's the ability to push through the fear and to trust God through it, even when everything around you looks like it's going to fall apart. But um, mm -hmm. in your own life, Dan, um, how would you say that uh, you, you talked about how you were to some degree paralyzed by that way of thinking? Um, uh, how would you say that, that, that God has helped you uh, to overcome that and to, to live a, 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 you know, a, a spiritually fruitful and, uh, and good life? Well, I think, again, it, it really is all that God has done. It, it, there was a point in my life where there really was kind of a divine intervention where I was so broken uh, and so locked up that God just, you know, he, he moved in. My, it was my first year in Bible college. And I even wondered why in the world I was in Bible college, because how do you, how do you go in ministry if you can't talk? And I couldn't. How do you go into ministry if you hate God? And I really did. I think I would say I lived in a love-hate relationship with him because I loved him, yes, but I also hated the, you know, because I hated myself and the way that he made me. And, and so because of that, you know, that, that paralyzed me. And, and so it, he, there was an intervention where God showed up, spoke into my life, but then there was the walking out of that. I believe in those divine moments where God's spirit touches people, where God turns things around, all of that. But I also know that there's usually a process to walking out of all the stuff. You know, it, so much depends on the lies. You know, we, we, the lies govern our life if we don't face those lies and let God deal with them. And, and so there was this process of walking out of all of the lies that I believed, the lie that said, Dan, you'll never be anything. Dan, you, you can't possibly, you, you really can't serve God. You don't, your faith is not there. Uh, you don't have the ability to do this. Uh, you don't have the person. That, I mean, all those lies that come, uh, I had to face them and realize what God says is is more powerful than the lies I believed and allow him to break the power of those lies in me so that I could then begin to take the steps of faith. And, and that really is a process. And I think it's really a lifelong process. Mm. For me, it's a process that's gone on and on. There were key moments, but it really is a process even to this day where I have to stop and say, no, I choose to believe what God says, not what I feel at the moment. Or, you know, those old fe feelings come back, old flashbacks to, to feelings I had, you know, 100 years ago. And, uh, but I have to stop and say, no, I, I'm not gonna give in to this. I believe what God said and choose to trust him, choose to step out even when I'm afraid. And I think that's partly Caleb and Joshua. I'm sure they were they had their points of fear, but they were again different attitude. We're willing to step out and go for it because we we believe what God says. But mm -hmm. how important? How, how would you advise people uh, in the, their attitude to the Bible um, and and getting uh, the truths kind of in? 
uh, in a way that they would break down some of those mental strongholds? Well, I, again, it always comes back to relationship. And each person is different. Uh, and God knows that. And he knows how to break down those strongholds step by step. I think there are certain things that we can do, like become students of God's word. Uh, and in doing so, I mean, getting God's word in your mind and believing it, choosing to believe it, even when your emotions uh, or your, your flesh says, no, that can't happen. That's not true. What does God say? And, and that, that is also battle because everything inside of you will war and say, no, that's not my experience. And, and there are times you just have to kind of say, God, I need you. I need the power of your spirit to help me even believe what your word says, because I'm really struggling with it right now. Um, this young man that you just mentioned while you were talking, I thought of him and he, his mind had been destroyed by drugs. And a place where, I mean, the doctors had basically said to his parents, there's nothing that more that we can do. Brain cells have been destroyed and we can't recreate them. And so he came to, to us, to a ministry in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, it was kind of, it was a drug program. And uh, all the staff said, no, we, we can't deal with him because this was a rehab and this guy was not, there was no way to, for, for him to rehabilitate because brain cells had been destroyed. But something inside of me and the chaplain just said, do it, take him in and let's see what God can do. And the staff was really right. This, this was beyond our territory, but, uh, but we really felt God saying it. And she had a plan, the chaplain had a plan to get students to read the word to him for a half hour at a time, and then to take a break, and then another student would read for a half hour, and, and God was going to heal his mind. Well, I really, I didn't say this, but I really thought it was a little bit crazy, because he can't even put his first and last name together. How is he going to memorize scripture? But I thought, you know, at least it gives the uh, it gives the students time to read the word, and it's kind of a sneaky way to get God's word into them, even if this young man uh, doesn't get a hold of it. And so we started doing it, and I would go by, and I would see him sitting there in kind of a lotus position with his just blank look on his face and just hollow, and somebody would be reading the scripture to him, and and I would just think, and nothing he's not even getting this but over the months as they kept doing it and just kept doing it and kept doing it it something began to change and after a while i noticed that he now was beginning to read the verses himself and then beginning to memorize them which and i thought that could never happen but he began to memorize them he was there for about a year or maybe just a little over a year and um, when he left there, he went to, uh, to, the, to Stanford University, which is one of the highest school you know, in the United States, went to Stanford University as a student. And his mind, his mind had been healed. And, and so much of that, I mean, we loved him, we prayed for him, all of that's extremely important. But I'm convinced also that just getting the truth of God's word, God's word is not an ordinary book. So get God's word in your mind. I think that's a key way, uh, it has been for me, to get past all of the lockup and all the, you know, and then we can do a lot for one another and just, you know, encouraging and building one another that can help get past a lot of these points of lockup. Um, Get, you know, give yourself grace, get into the word and ask, ask the Holy Spirit to clean out all that and to show you more and more of who God's made you to be. That's a simple answer. That's great. Not always easy, but simple. Thank you, Lord, that 
I thank you for the technology that really works over the thousands of miles and how you can connect us even though we're not in the same room, not in the same country. And you, you're not limited even by the technology. So Lord, I ask that those that are reaching out now, that you will touch them in Jesus' name. Let them begin to see and believe the truth of what you say about them. Let them see who they really are, not what uh, an unhappy parent said, not what a school teacher uh, said about them, not what friends said, not what they picked up themselves, but what you say about them. And let that truth get into them and let them begin step by step to believe that you are a good God and that you have a dream for our lives. You have a plan and that you are, you're for us and you want to bring complete freedom in our lives. So do it, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Dad. Thank you. So, and again, looking forward to seeing everybody. <laughs>